while we don't want a Jesus like that, uh, oftentimes the church conducts its, itself in a manner that resembles that. Guilty? Guilty? You know, uh, there's this thing called legalism. And legalism shows no pity for people. Legalism is, uh, as someone once said, it makes my opinion your burden. It makes my opinion your boundary. It makes my opinion your obligation. And we don't resemble the spirit of Christ when we tend to be hypocritical in our judgments and our assessments, when we are legalistic in our approach to people. We don't want a Jesus like this. Thank God we don't have a Jesus like this. But we can do better as the church in resembling the spirit and ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, here's the truth. Jesus never preaches truth unlovingly, but he does preach it unflinchingly. What's, what's the balance? What's the balance between people of truth, but yet being people of grace? This morning, we look at Luke chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, turn there. We're going to look at six woes. There's six pronouncements of sorrow towards very shallow leaders in the church. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the lawyers, you, you, you name it. The, these are men who often were hypocritical, who were legalistic, and they, and they just really burdened people, which was just the opposite of what God wants for us. I'm going to tell you right now that the God that we lo love and worship and adore is a God not of guilt but of grace. And we're going to talk about that this morning. As we look at these six woes found in Luke chapter 11, um, starting at verse 42, if you have your Bibles, let's, let's read the passage in its entirety. And I, and I want us to look at some very specific things and, and, and look at how they relate to us and how we perhaps conduct ourselves with others as, as God helps us not only to examine our own hearts, but also just maybe what we've imposed on others that God doesn't want us to impose on others. Because the Christian journey is a tough one. <coughs> Walking with Christ is a tough one. We don't need to make it harder for each other. Amen? We exist to help lighten one another's load. We all have a, enough self-shame and self-guilt and self-criticism inside. We don't need others in the church to make it worse. And so Jesus is going to give us a word of encouragement this morning. So Luke chapter 11 Look at this, how he wants us to rightly assess why we do what we do, which is always a, a, a great question to answer. Verse 42, so Jesus, you remember last week, he's dining with the Pharisee, and the Pharisee was uh, judging Jesus because he didn't ceremonially wash his hands. And, uh, and Jesus just went right for the jugular. He just condemned this Pharisee for, for making ceremony the the end-all be-all when it comes to his spirituality. And he continues. He doesn't let off the accelerator. Verse 42, check this out. So he says, but woe to you, Pharisees. And as we're reading this, go ahead and you want to circle that word woe in your Bibles or highlight it on your, your tablet or smartphone. But woe to you, Pharisees. For, yeah, some of you who have been with us for a while, when you mention the word Pharisee, you're supposed to boo. So woe to you, Pharisees. Okay, now we're not going to do it anymore because I know some of you just will take it out of hand, all right? Talk about being legalistic. Thanks, Pastor Scott. All right. So woe to you, Pharisees. You pay the tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herb and yet disregard justice and the love of God. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love for being in the seats, the front seats in the synagogue and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you have become like concealed tombs and the people who walk over them are unaware of it. And then one of the lawyers said to Jesus and replied, Jesus, when you say this, you insult us too. Oh, someone's getting their feelings hurt, right? Okay, check this out. Verse 46, but he says to them, woe to you. Boy, Jesus is really cruel right here, isn't he? Woe to you lawyers, experts in the law, for you weigh down people with your burdens that are hard to bear while you yourselves don't even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. 
Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and it was your fathers who killed them. Consequently, you are witnesses and approve the deeds of your father, because it was they who killed them, and you build their tombs. For this reason also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them will kill, uh, they will kill, and some they will persecute in order that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the house of God, yes, I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, verse 52, for you have taken away the key of knowledge, you did not enter it yourselves, and those who were entering it you hindered. And when he left there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to be very hostile and to question him closely on many subjects, plotting against him to catch him in something he may say. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. Boy, this is a severe passage, isn't it? This is a difficult passage because it, it seems to go right with the Jesus we just saw in the video. He's saying some pretty harsh things. He's saying some very difficult things. But he's directing them at men who should have known better. These were the spiritual elite of the day. These were the spiritual educated of the day. And yet they were not doing ministry to point people toward God. They were actually adding burdens and steering the people away from God. And so Jesus is always going to be the most harsh towards the people of God. We have a responsibility we have a responsibility not only to understand God, but we have a responsibility to communicate God, his will, his word, his purposes. So we're going to notice three, three groups here this morning, and we're going to kind of take apart these woe passages. These are woes of sorrow. When you write down the word woe, write down the word sorrow right next to it. His, he's heartbroken. Jesus loves these men, but they are hardened in their way. There are people who honor God with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. And so when Jesus says woe to them, this is a word of sorrow. And he's trying once again to reach their hearts. First group we see are the practitioners. Here's the dangers of legalistic application. So the Pharisees were the ones who applied the law to daily life. The the lawyers or the experts were the ones who interpreted it. And so the lawyers would give the interpretation to the Pharisees. The Pharisees would then have them uh, teach the people to apply it to their lives. So he has a word against both of these groups. First, against those who apply the law. The Pharisees were the ones who helped the Jews, quote unquote, help them walk according to what God wanted. Three things we notice. Number one is, the problem is they had a preoccupation with the trivial. They minored in the majors and they majored in the minors. You guys heard that expression before? See, these men were preoccupied with the trivial. Look at verse 42. Yeah, you go to your gardens and you pick the rue and you pick the mint and you pick all this stuff and you tithe everything that you get from your garden, but you've neglected, you've ignored the weightier issues of the law. And what are those? Justice with other people. You're great at what you give from your garden, but you're horrible in taking care of the orphan, the oppressed, the needy, the widow. There's no love for God. Yes, it's fine to tithe your mint and your rue and your garden herbs, but it is not fine when that is all you focus on and you neglect the person who is needy right outside your door. See, ladies and gentlemen, we can become preoccupied with the trivial. We can sometimes follow the letter of the law and miss the spirit of the law. See, he's not saying a tithe is bad, but he's saying when that's all you focus on, it's easy to prop yourself up and think, hey, I'm doing this okay. But really, in the end, it comes down to, to Matthew 23. He says in another place, look at it, he says, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and... Ooh, that sounds good, doesn't it? Oh, so good. But you've neglected the weightier matters of the law. He continues, justice, mercy, faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others, you blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Matter of fact, write those two words down in your notes, gnat and camel. We're all good in gnat issues. 
You can write a column of nat things, right? It's like, I pray, and I read my Bible, and I tithe, right? Those are nat issues. The camel issues are the ones that we tend to ignore. And that is, how do we live out this sense of justice that God has put upon our lives as a calling in a world that's dying? See, Micah chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, classic text on this, right? Would the Lord, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression and the fruit for my body for the sin of my soul? And he says this, he has told you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. He's not saying those other spiritual practices are bad. He's saying that that's not all there is when it comes to your, your walk with God. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to consider why we have this rigid insistence on focusing on trivial matters. And I'm going to tell you why, probably as I just even examine my own heart. When I focus on trivial things way too much, way too intensely, it's because I'm trying to cover some sin in my heart. Can I get anyone else to say, Pastor Scott, you're not alone on that? Two people? Okay, good. We're in therapy together. Hi, I'm Pastor Scott, and sometimes I hide sin in my heart. Hi, I'm Pastor Scott, and sometimes I emphasize the insignificant to cover up the significant things that are going on in my heart that aren't honoring to the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, we're all prone to do this. Remember, we're all born legalists. We have to grow and become Pharisees. We're all born into this world legalists. But we have to become these people that make sure our externals are, are, are portrayed in a way where it's like, boy, that guy's an upstanding guy, but you don't know what's going on inside my heart. The true follower of Christ is one who has a true desire for justice. Full stop, period. I'm, I'm glad you tithe. And I'm glad you pray. And I'm glad you read your Bible. But if you're neglecting the weightier things of Scripture, how are you doing loving your spouse? How are you doing showing your kids the gospel through your life and through your words and through your deeds? How are you doing with loving your neighbor? How are you doing with, with, with taking care of the poor and the needy? They're with us. They're around us. But don't you think that the extent of your spiritual walk is just throwing something in the offering box or putting, you know, put in a prayer request on a piece of paper, how are you living your life to be a conduit of God's justice to an oppressed world? That's the question. What tends to occupy your life? This focus on the tiny issues of Christianity or a passion for the bigger things? Let me ask you another way. Do you have a fire in your soul that burns for people more than a passion for your practices? I was at a men's retreat one time. You guys are going to think I'm a total jerk, but you guys already think that, so I'm at a men's retreat one time, and I overhear this group of guys, and they're fighting about some sort of spiritual discipline topic. I mean, they're getting into it, and I don't know if it was about predestination or praying or whatever, but I just felt like, and I just kind of stepped into the conversation, I, I said, I got a question for you guys. More important than what you're talking about, when was the last time you shared the gospel with somebody? And they're all like, wah, wah. <laughs> same question to you. It's easy to get on Facebook or Instagram and, and, and debate and throw all these things out there about your position on, you know, face masks and vaccines and all the current hot topics, right? Here's my question to you. Do you spend as much time thinking about who is it that w God wants me to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with? Can I get an amen from somebody? You spin your wheels talking about things that are not eternally important, and while we miss out on the fact that men and women are created in the image of God and they have souls that are eternal, where are they going to spend their eternity? We are all prone to focus on the trivial things. Why? They can make us feel better. They make us feel like, at the end of the day, I've got something going. But in reality, are you passionate for the lives of men and women? Love God, love your neighbor. There's the sum of the law. Amen? Point number two. There's a preoccupation with the limelight. So it's not just the trivial, it's the limelight. It's the fact that Jesus says in verse 43, you want the seats in the front of the synagogue and you want to be greeted in the marketplace. Rabbi, 
good to see you. Feels kind of good when someone says, Pastor Scott, and I'm in the whiskey aisle. No, you know, whatever. <laughs> Momentary awkwardness, right? So the seats in the synagogue were up where the scrolls were, and the seats for the leaders were actually faced so that they're facing the congregation. So they're in the spot where they're actually able to observe the, 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 the synagogue. And I'm going to tell you one time, so I, I was out in California at school for one semester because that's all I could afford, you're right? Um, so I was out there, and I met a, a, a black student who said, hey, I want you to go to church with me in Compton. Anyone ever been to Compton before? Yeah, that's what I thought. So, um, so predominantly black community. And I went to this church, and you know you're in a, just an awesome church when they give you a fan on the way in, and the fan has an advertisement for the local funeral home or mortuary <laughs> on it. I go, we're not in Kansas anymore, right? So I'm walking in. I'm the only white dude there, right? And uh, so we sit up, and we're probably two or three rows back in this, this huge church. I'm the only white guy there. And what was really cool, <laughs> well, cool, maybe, uh, the pastor says, hey, we have a guest here today, <laughs> right? And uh, as if I didn't stand out already, right? So uh, they said, uh, you know, so-and-so to my friend, uh, introduce the guest. And so he introduces me. And all of a sudden, the band starts kicking in. Like, doo -doo. And all of a sudden, like, there's this party, and they, this robe comes out. And they put this robe on me, right? And they're like, yeah, yeah. And they bring me up on the stage, and they're kind of like dancing around me. And, and then they have me sit down on this chair on the stage facing the, the church. And I'm like going, this ain't the Baptist church I'm from in, in, in Phoenix. It was, it was the, the coolest and yet the most strange event I've ever been to. Um, but it, it felt kind of weird, right? Being celebrated, being focused on. And, and I know their, their intention was to welcome me as a guest, to love me. And, and, but, you know, there's people that they live for that. There's, they're living like, when's the, when's the music going to start? When's the robe coming out, right? It's like James Brown's hot tub. Like, here we go. Right, yeah, we're going to have a party. And these guys just love the limelight. And the fact is this, you know, we got to be careful. We, we can celebrate one another. We can get excited for one another. We can appreciate guests and visitors. And, but when you make it something you're preoccupied all the time, how, how are you in serving God and no one ever saw your service for him? Are, are you okay with that? Are you okay if no one greeted you in the marketplace as pastor or whatever, or you didn't have the best seat in, in, in church? Are you okay with just saying to, to all people, you know what? I, I'm good. I don't need your applause. Are you good with saying, I don't need your approval? Are you okay with just doing what God has called you to do and, and to, to, to not desire to be worship, but to, to freely offer up worship? Because there's, there's, a, there's a tendency that, that we have where God continues to want us to question our motives. Look at John 5, verse 44. Jesus says this, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? See, there's this idea that in Scripture that says reputation is what others think you are. Character is what God knows you to be. What do, you, what do you focus on? Are you focused on reputation or are you focused on character? Because I'm going to tell you right now, it can't be both. Are you focused on reputation or are you focused on character? I will tell you, God values character more than he values religious titles and seats of honor. God values who you are when the lights are off and no one's looking. Are you content with the approval of God and that's it? So I'm mentoring this Korean pastor in, in California who he's doing like a coffee house church so who better than to talk to the coffee house pastor guy right and uh, he asked me via zoom so we have a weekly zoom meeting he said um, you know what do you do when others don't like your approach to ministry when, you, when it comes to your model of ministry and you know what I said to him I said I don't want this to come across unloving again you guys are going to think I'm a jerk I said Caro I don't care what others think about my ministry. Woo! I care about what God thinks. Now, that doesn't mean I can't learn and listen and, and heed. One, but when it comes to 
you're going to have your critics. Anyone ever had their critics? Raise your hand. Yes, we've had our critics. And a lot of the times the critics can be nasty and they can preoccupy too much of our time. And when we start listening to the voice of our critics who oftentimes don't want what's best for us, we can give them too much weight. I'm going to tell you right now, you either live for the approval of man or you live for the approval of God. I'm choosing to live for the approval of God. And I am content with that. Be careful with whose approval you seek. If you want to seek man's approval, God's approval won't mean anything to you. And if you seek man's approval, it is a craving that is never satiated. But if you seek God's approval, the approval of man won't mean anything. And I'm going to tell you right now that if no one saw your spirituality, would you still be de dedicated to Jesus Christ as ever? And I'm going to say, I'm there. But I have to fight to be there. Because it's easy to be swayed and it's easy to be tempted. And it's easy to be enticed uh, by what other people think. Are you okay to be dedicated to Christ if no one ever saw your spirituality? That's where God wants to bring you. Point number three, you're preoccupied with externals. He says to the, the Pharisees. See, it's not just the trivials. It's not just the, the, the limelight, but it's also the externals. He says in, in verse 44, you're like whitewashed tombs or graves. See, what they would do was that when there was a, a, a religious festival in, in the city, they had foreigners come in from, from out of town who didn't know their way around town. And in order for these visitors not to step on the graves of people that were unmarked, these Pharisees would go out and whitewash the graves so that visitors wouldn't step on the graves. You ever been to a, 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 a cemetery and your parents were like, don't step on the graves, right? And so you're real careful to walk around headstones and things like that. But what if there were no headstones? What if there's no way for you to see? See, if you step on the grave, according to the Pharisees, you are ritually unclean. So they would spray the graves so that people would avoid them. And essentially what Jesus says to the, the Jesus says to the Pharisees is this, you should be whitewashing yourselves because people are coming in contact with you and you, because you're sinful, are passing on a moral contagion and now defiling them. Can you imagine hearing Jesus say this to you? You are encouraging people toward defilement and not purity. Matter of fact, write down that word in your notes, purity. See, when you're focused on externals, you actually don't lead people toward Christ and not even in grace. See, when you're focused on externals, it can lead nothing, it can lead nowhere but defilement. Some of us, when it comes to people, when they come in contact with us, we're not encouraging them in inner purity, we're actually encouraging them in outer defilement. Can you imagine the fact that Jesus is saying to these, these men that, you know what, you, you, you yourselves should be marked because you're not helping people, you're actually harming them because you're not encouraging a purity from within. This week, I don't know if you guys heard, the, the Russians are up to it again. When are the Russians not up to something, right? They actually hacked Kenneth Copeland's email server. You guys know who Kenneth Copeland is? He's a false teacher in the church, valued at $800 million. So here's a pastor who is valued, his ministry, $800 million. Now why, now the Russians have hacked into his information, so guess what they want? Money. Now, I'm sitting here waiting for the report that says Pastor Copeland is not worried about anything being exposed because he's lived his life in the light. How many of you think that's actually going to be the news story next week? It's not. Even in ministry, there are men and women who do things with wrong motives. They get rich off people who can't afford to pay money towards these ministries. And so here is a man who's going to be held accountable. And again, another opportunity for the heathen to blaspheme our God. When David was confronted by Nathan, he said, 
David, what you've done with Bathsheba and killing her husband is wrong, and now you've given an excuse for those who don't know God to further blaspheme his name. Ladies and gentlemen, one thing we can do to live our lives to the honor of God is not be so focused on outward cleanliness. We need to constantly be aware of inward holiness. Can you write down that phrase, inward holiness? This is why when it comes to our conversations with each other, we ought to be asking one another these questions. How you doing? How's your heart? How's your mind? What, do, what have you been reading in the word? What have you been praying for? What are the things that, are, that you're wrestling with or struggling with? See, do you encourage others with wisdom from God's word? Or do you tend to uh, encourage others by your, your own opinions? Because here's what religion does is it covers up, and this is dangerous, it's a, dang, it's, a, it's a dangerous cover-up for spiritual deadness. That's what religion is. It's a cover for spiritual deadness. Can I just tell you right now, let's be a church community that's not focused just on the outsides primarily, but let's be primarily focused on our hearts. So the Pharisees, really bad practitioners. But what about those who interpret the scripture. Here are the, the, uh, the experts, we're going to call them. Here's the dangers of legalistic interpretation. This is <coughs> near and dear to my heart because I get to interpret the word of God each week for us as a church community. And so this, this hits near to me because I want to be faithful to the spirit of God's word. So you'll notice there's three things that we're going to notice here. The first one being this, the problem of burdening the people. Look at verse 45. So the lawyer says to Jesus, teacher, when you say this, you hurt our feelings too. Can I ask you right now, has Jesus ever hurt your feelings? I mean, it's, it's one of the best things to have happen to you when Jesus hurts your feelings. Don't our feelings need to be hurt more often? Can I, be, can I get an amen from somebody? Now, that's not permission for you to hurt someone's feelings in the name of Jesus, okay? It's just so we're clear. But sometimes when you re read the words of Jesus, sometimes you're like, wow, that, that cuts deep. That cuts deep. So these, these experts in the law say to him, you're, you're hurting our feelings because we're the ones giving the interpretation to the Pharisees. So when you criticize them, you're criticizing us. And Jesus says, well, guess what's going to happen right now? I'm going to criticize you guys. You're burdening the people. Look at verse 46. Woe to you, lawyers, for you weigh down men with burdens hard to bear while you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Meaning, you have an expectation on others that you yourselves find loopholes to avoid. I got a name for you. Gavin Newsom. This week... Gavin Newsom played this card. He went out to a restaurant, number one, without a mask on. Number two, he sat with a group larger than what California had permitted. You go out without a mask on and you sit in a public restaurant, which I believe most of them are closed, in a group larger than what the state, guess what the fine is for that? $1,000 and six months in jail. But here the governor finds a loophole to go to a Napa Valley restaurant called the French Laundry. Anyone ever been there before? Yeah, way too spendy for us. But he goes without a mask, sits with a larger group, and guess what happens? He just issues an apology. No fine, no jail. Yet there's men and women who are facing penalties because they've done the same exact thing. See, you can come up with rules and laws, but if you yourself don't obey and abide, you're guilty too. But the religious leaders found a loophole. They found a way around it. And I'm going to tell you right now, the, the demands of Scripture, they're tough. Would you, would you admit that what God's will wants for us, it, it's difficult? But what we do as people, when we understand God's expectations, we also understand, understand God's encouragement. 
to pursue what he wants us to pursue. Can you write those two words down? Expectation and encouragement. Because I, as a pastor, sometimes issue some pretty difficult challenges. And I issue those for myself, and I issue those for us, the, the, the body of Christ. But with those expectations that I believe God wants us to abide by when it comes to his, his word and his desire, there's also encouragement that says we can do this. We can walk in holiness. We can walk in purity. We can love our spouses. We can love our kids. We can, we can tithe the mint and the cumin and the rue, and we can, and we can do justice. Are we ever going to do any of those things perfectly? No. Therefore, we won't make it a burden on each other, but we will encourage each other along the way. Amen? Expectations plus encouragement. Huge. Stop burdening the people with things that are, 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 are so difficult already. Ten commandments. Ten commandments God gave Moses. You want to know what the religious leaders did with those Ten Commandments? Created 16 and 619 commandments. Then you want to know what other religious leaders did? Created 10,000 rules to support 619 commandments to then support the Ten Commandments. They have books of just rules. And can I tell you right now, that is not what God has wanted us to do. Create tens of thousands of rules. Can I tell I, I faced this personally as a pastor years ago. I was part of a church where, where I worked with Pharisees. And you know what? I was one of them. And this church basically said to me, we don't want you here anymore. So draft up a letter and let the church know you're going to be leaving. So I drafted the letter. And I'm going to tell you right now, it was, it was generic yet specific enough where people need to know that there wasn't any sin issue. It wasn't like they asked me to resign because of moral infidelity or, or embezzlement or something like that. There, it was really nothing black or white. It was just gray. I read this letter in front of the church, letting the church know that we're leaving, that this is what the leadership has re respect, re re um, requested of me, and, and I submitted to that. The people stood up with this letter. And several of them held this letter up and said, if you're asking our pastor to leave because of this, how are we going to survive this environment? This, this is what they said. If this is what you're asking him to leave over, we're guilty. So should we therefore then leave? And people stood up with this letter and they walked out. Because when the Pharisees create burdens that are not reflected in God's will and shouldn't be burdens on our lives, the people know, I can't live in this environment. I can't submit to this kind of this leadership that almost expects perfection and almost expects this performance to be flawless and, and so put together. And all these people just stood up and left and said, we cannot live with this. And I fell for the heart of those people. Because as their pastor, I couldn't live under that either. And while it was the most difficult season of our lives, my wife and I's lives together, it was also the most freeing season too. Because guess what? We were no longer around the Pharisees. Damn the Pharisees! Say it out loud. Damn the Pharisees! Some of you are like, I just cussed a little bit in church. I would never, as your pastor, burden you with things that I'm not willing to be burdened by myself. But the burden should be that of doing the will and work of God, which is actually a pleasant burden. It's a pleasing burden. To do the work of Christ is a difficult work. But we're not going to do it without encouraging each other. Amen? Amen. Point number two. There's the problem of burying the prophets. Can I, can I go back? Let me go back real quick. Matthew 11, write this verse down if, you, if you're not familiar with it. This is why Jesus said, come to me all you who, are la who labor and are heavy laden 
and I will give you rest. Ladies and gentlemen, work for Christ never leads to guilt. It always leads to grace. Please don't forget that. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's grace right there. When you do work for God, it leads you to not guilt, but to grace. I felt like that was important. Okay, point number two, burying the prophets. So here's what happened to the prophets. We're going to speed things up a bit here. Here's what happened to the prophets. They brought God's message, and they were killed for it. Starting with Abel to Zechariah. The entire Old Testament were these men who would bring forth a challenge for God's people. How are you doing with fulfilling the law of God? And the people didn't want to hear of it, so they killed them. It's a dangerous thing to bring God's message to the world. And it's especially dangerous to bring God's message to the church. Can I tell you? One of the most crazy things to consider is that this is the most difficult place to bring God's message. Because we have this air of Christianity and spirituality, but, there, but we, we lack the power therein. Right? We hold to a form of godliness, but we lack the power inside. See, here's the problem. The law and the prophets work hand in hand. The law brings God's will and word to the people the prophets bring this sense of how are we doing with God's will and God's word. And when people don't want to hear what God has to say, guess what the people did? They killed the prophets. And then Jesus turns to these people and says, and just like they killed the prophets, guess what you're going to do? Essentially, he says, you're going to end up killing me. The greatest prophet, the son of God, God himself, is killed by the very people he's accusing of murdering the messenger of God's will and God's word. Think about this. That the people do terrible things to the, the ones who bring God's message and they would ultimately crucify Jesus as evidence of this hardness, this, this rejection. See, they built tombs, they buried the prophets, but it has nothing to do with how you bury the prophets. What matters is do you listen to the voice of the prophet. You can build great shrines to Christ, wonderful statues, wear wonderful cro crosses. You can make it all beautiful and, and pure, but do you follow the words of Christ? Do you heed his word? Last point is this, problem of blocking the path. Verse 40, uh, <coughs> 52. You have taken away the key of knowledge. You hold the key to unlocking life's most important question. Who is the key? Write this down. Jesus. He says them, woe to you because you've missed seeing Jesus in the, in the scriptures. When Jesus in Luke 24 was walking with the two men from Emmaus, he unlocked the mystery of who he was is found in the entire Old Testament. And yet these, these experts in the law missed Christ. And can I just tell you, and I'm gonna, and this, is a, this is a black and white, very bold statement right here. If you miss Christ, you miss it all. If you miss the key of Jesus unlocking life's most important questions, you will miss out on it all. Because without Jesus, we will always give the wrong solution to life's difficulty. Always. And the number one difficulty that we all have in life is this. The problem of sin. Can you write that word down, sin? And I know some of you are like cringing writing that word down. Write it down. Because there's the presence of sin, there's the gravity of sin, there's the solution to the problem of sin. And those are, can only be answered in the personal work of Jesus Christ. Can I just tell you right now, you guys, I do not want to be a wall to helping people understand the answer to their sin problem. I want to be a doorway to helping them understand. Write those two words down, wall or door. What are you going to be? Are you like those experts in the law that are blocking the path from people getting to know Jesus, who is the door? 
to life, who's the, who's the shepherd that wants to take care of his sheep, he's the bread that's come down from heaven who wants to satisfy the deepest hunger in people, are you going to block the path or are you going to be a doorway? The, the, the choice is yours. I want people to know Christ. I want people to know that there's a God who loves them even as sinful as we all are. That the presence of sin will one day be done away with, the gravity of sin can be alleviated, and the problem of sin is answered in one who has not only taken our sins upon himself, but has given his, his, us his righteousness. Can anyone say hallelujah for that? There are people who hinder people come to know Jesus. I pray we're not one of them. We close with this, the moralist. Because whether we're talking about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the experts of the law, there's the dangers of legalistic renunciation, meaning this. We are not about moral behavior. We are about renewed hearts. These men, instead of repenting, now found a way to try to kill Jesus. Look at what it says in verse 53 and 54. They began to be very hostile and to question him closely on many subjects, plotting against him to catch him in something he might say. Ladies and gentlemen, those terms and those two verses are hunting terms. Jesus is now the prey. But when it comes to getting rid of Jesus, anytime you renounce Christ and his will, you're not getting rid of Jesus. You're essentially, essentially shooting yourself in the foot. See, these men should have repented and said they rejected. Instead of discovering freedom, they chose a deeper bondage from themselves. Can I just tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, do not renounce what God is doing in your heart. Repent and receive and taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? Amen. God has a word to say to us. He's a God who has pity on us. He's a God who shows us grace and mercy and kindness and compassion. Let's not be preoccupied with the externals, but let's go deep on what's going on on the inside and be a community that welcomes and loves one another as we all continue to remember that we're all works in progress in this thing we call life and in this journey with Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. let's stand, let's pray. Father, thanks for today, for giving us time together as a, as a community to, to spend time singing and to spend time diving into your word and to spend time hearing about what you're doing in other parts of our city, Lord. It is truly a wonderful thing to, to know that you are active and you are working and you are changing lives, not just ours, but the lives of people that, are, that, are, that we get to love and we get to be able to be in relationship with. Thank you for being a God whose kindness leads us to repentance for being a God who allows us to go out as salt and light and to love others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray you help us battle the Pharisee that exists within each and every one of us. Forgive us for the ways we've made the minor things major and the major thing minor and, and all the other things we've talked about today. Lord, thank you for being a God who wants obedience more than sacrifice. You want a people who honor you with not just our lips, but our heart. Lord, help us to be those kind of people. Thanks for being so good to us. Thank you for this church community, for loving us as much as you do. Be glorified in our lives. Please give us the strength to, to live for your honor and glory. And just thank you for being here with us today. We pray this all in the name and the person and work of Jesus Christ. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord give us strength to you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Have a great day, you guys.